All right, this is an episode about truth. I didn't mean it to be, but we're speaking to street epistemology later, and I had one thing written that was related to that. Perfect. So I was reflecting on uh, truth versus effectiveness. And for much of my life, I've heard the idea that uh, the measure of truth is effectiveness. Like mm-hmm. something is true if it works. So well, like that's the Tony Robbins belief, right? It's Tony Robbins. It's like, oh, gravity is true if your predictions about gravity work. And that that's how a lot of things happen. Mm-hmm. Or, or how we treat a lot of things. Uh, interesting moments of this breaking, for instance, Jordan Peterson, when he was talking to Sam Harris, Brett Weinstein brought up the idea of treating all guns as if they're loaded. This is where truth and effectiveness we can sort of conceptually see break. Like, mm. it is more effective to treat every gun as if it is loaded when it comes to, like, in your house. It's about hold. safety, sure. It's about safety. Now, not necessarily if you're in a war, in that case. Yeah, <laughs> treat, yeah, yeah, yeah. treat them like they're unloaded and make sure that they're loaded or check. There's a different rule there. But you can see how, uh, depending on the context, what is effective and what we might call true can diverge. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I've just been noticing that in my life and uh the measure that I often use of what is true is what works, what gets me what I want, what, go ahead. Can I gun, in the gun circumstance, I think the problem isn't if you pursue truth, it's if you're overconfident that you know the truth without checking. Yes. So if the rule for guns, instead of saying treat every gun like it's loaded, was check every gun to see if it's loaded when you pick it up Mm -hmm. and make sure it's unloaded when you put it down, that would also work. Mm -hmm. But the problem is you run into people who think it's not loaded but they haven't actually pursued truth. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. And so truth is always effective, but we're not omniscient. It's not always effective depending on your goals. So like self-deception is effective. Like if I can convince myself Mm -hmm. that my product is really good and it's only kind of good, I'm going to be a better salesman. Mm. So what works for the me for the purposes of the ego and your survival is not actually what is true. But go ahead. Um, just another thing that popped in my head. Short term, mm-hmm. potentially. Yes. But long term, even if your goal is self creating wealth, it's just selfish, right? Yeah, yeah. Acknowledging the truth that your product is mediocre and making a great product and then actually selling it well will sell the same in the short term. It'll cost you time in investment to get there, Mm -hmm. but it'll cost you same in the short term and more in the long term. Because when you are really good at selling the mediocre thing, your profits spike, then everybody talks about how crappy it is, and then it stops. Mm -hmm. But when it's great, your sales spike, and then word of mouth takes off, and then it grows. Yes. So I think even in that circumstance, if you knew truth and your goal was creating wealth, you'd be better off because you wouldn't sell something mediocre ever. Well, so here's the issue is that you're, you're identifying something that is as you increase the time span, uh, focus, uh, truth becomes more important mm-hmm. as you increase time spans. Yeah. But the problem is the human lifespan isn't long enough for that to always be true. So like if you're Kim Jong-un, it behooves you to believe that you are divinely ordained. Mm. Because if you could just go your whole life, <laughs> like believing you're b- divinely ordained, like the pharaohs, like the pharaohs you'll get everything you want, yeah. you know? And if you don't, you're not going to get everything you want because right. then you're like, oh, I can't really do this anymore. I have to like open up this country and, you know, suffer a yeah. military tribunal and probably get hanged. We need to do <laughs> studies to see if the pharaohs were actually happier than regular people. <laughs> well, so happiness, th- this is what I'm, I'm uh, confronting and realizing is that There's going to be, even over the span of a lifetime, moments where what you want, what your ego wants, what gets you attention, makes the sale, uh, prevents you from shooting someone or helps you to shoot someone, diverges from what is true. Mm -hmm. And your survival goals are going to be better suited by ignoring the truth. But I'm beginning to and like tap into when I'm especially when I'm high and on these psychedelics, a deeper respect for truth, Mm. even at personal cost. And I think this is what ego death is in some way it's the realization that uh this ego is a construct and i'm willing to literally die to get beyond it to what is more true and i've i actually when i experienced ego death on psychedelics fought like crazy (laughs) like kicked and screamed and was like hanging on to any fragment of a memory that i had because i was like fuck truth like do not let me die do not let me die and it was it was the most visceral panic and so i know that i'm not actually 
there where I care ultimately about truth. Right. But I, I'm starting to recognize that there is a value beyond what I can see to it. And my own life is just filled with decisions that are not interested in truth. Like what works for me, you know, what gets me what yeah. I want, what, what lies about myself. Can I tell myself that other people will believe about me, um, that I'm not even aware of and that self-deception kicks in. And then I feel good about the lies that I tell everybody. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I was just, I was just thinking about that, noticing it, uh, no takeaway other than I'm trying to care about truth. Yeah. Well, actually, funny <laughs> enough, I actually think it is the best thing and the most effective thing, even, even in, in a human lifespan over the course of 50 years. I actually, there might be all times like the Pharaohs where mm -hmm. there's exceptions, but I, I do think that in, a lot of times when you try to circumvent truth for what's best for you, it does end up being something bad. I, uh, so I, I disagreed with your first sentence and I agreed with your last sentence, which is to say that, so like even one of the big lies might be the independence of the ego and the self. And we might all just be this big reality soup. So in one sense, it's like, no, nah, the truth is literally going to make you stop eating and die. So it's not good for your life. But within the parameters of that, I a hundred percent agree that like, there's times in our life where uh, if you, I don't know, say you cheat on your boyfriend or girlfriend and they'll never find out you did it in Las Vegas in a different, and you're like, I, I don't ever have to say this and it can just be fine. You are still better off telling the truth, having them freak out, maybe break up with you, losing the love of your life mm -hmm. and starting from a ground zero because what you don't realize is how that eats at your insides yeah. when you know that you did that and you can't share that with the person you're most intimate with. And it has these long-term consequences, which are very difficult to predict. Yeah. And funny enough, if you held yourself to that standard before you went, you, you probably wouldn't, wouldn't cheat because <laughs> yeah. you would know that you would tell the person if you did. Yes. And then you would realize that what you're doing isn't worth it. But if you convince yourself it's okay to lie, mm -hmm. you won't do the math right on the, on the benefit and the harm of what you're doing. Yes. Until it's too late. Yes. And then you'll realize I've I was too short. Like this is Naval Ravikant's thing. It's all mm -hmm. about the long term. I focused on the short term and now I regret it. Mm -hmm. And here we are. But if you had known you had to be honest the whole time, weirdly enough, you wouldn't do the thing that you regret doing. Oh, if you know you have to tell the truth, it slows down so many of your decisions yeah. that you make. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. If you're like, I'm going to have to tell someone about whatever it is if I do this. And uh, yeah, we talk about this in our marketing. We try to I think it's, man, this is why, like, I like the idea, the idea of a God that sees everything, but it's also external to you. And you then try to start like cheating and navigating. It's like, it's not actually necessarily an internalized sense of wanting to tell the truth, but that's kind of what it does is the idea that there's these eyes on you all the time makes you behave <laughs> in, a, in a much better way. Because even if nobody else saw it, you know, God, God has eyes on it. Yeah, so. now God's just called Siri. Yeah. <laughs> and it sees all. But what happens is that I think sometimes God can have this effect and Siri can have this effect and knowing that you're constantly being recorded, you still have like the evil thoughts or the evil things sure. and you just don't vocalize them and then you just. Well, this is something that Justin sent us a documentary, but what was it? Something left unsaid. Oh, I don't know that I saw this. Well, Justin is going to get us early access to a documentary that I forget the name of now. Better left unsaid. Better left unsaid. And. I, I haven't watched the movie, so I don't want to say that this is what's in it. But one of the things that I got from the trailer was there's there's been a rise of white supremacist ideas being verbalized in mm -hmm. America. Yeah. And the trailer seems to say that that's occurring as part of what you're talking about, this movement to tell people if you aren't doing well and you're not white, it's because the white people are holding you down. And if you are white, you are bad and racist because you are white. Mm -hmm. Actually, this documentary seems to think propelled the white supremacist movement. It made people who wouldn't have been white supremacists in a race neutral world, let's say, mm -hmm. to be become white supremacists. And I haven't seen the documentary, so I don't know why or how. And maybe that's a stupid idea, but it is an interesting one to me that I, I want to watch yeah, the, take a look. the documentary. I'm curious. We say no to things like this often, but that... Did somebody reach out asking this? Yeah, it's uh, Coleman Hughes' whoever representatives the, or something. Yeah, whoever was the point of contact with him. Oh, that's awesome. Passed yeah, he's in it. Our info. Oh. He's in it amongst... He's in it. Noam Chomsky's in it. Cool. 
So yeah, I would love to. I want to watch it and then we'll talk more about it. But that's just what that reminds me of. This, the, yeah, yeah. I'm interested. And, and the idea that uh, when you repress something, repressing something, acknowledging it, it, and dealing with it, it, it bounces. It just mm-hmm. Except, and this is the biggest thing, and maybe it's too short a time frame, China and North Korea, which are great examples of like, hey, Tiananmen Square never happened. Like there is a degree and it's not, I wouldn't say it's healthy psychologically for the individual, but I've been shocked at China's ability from from my perspective, reading books and articles, which are, you know, maybe I'm dead wrong and it's a free and open society to control uh, history, which is so easily shared by the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe the same thing is occurring in the U.S. I mean, we talk about the American Revolution. The Brits talk about the war of American aggression. <laughs> you know, so there's there's a degree of that. But the idea that people uh, have never heard of Tiananmen Square, whereas even in America, it's like. But they have. Have you seen the some interviews? of them? Yeah, they like they ask, what's today's date? Yeah. And they're like July 21st no, no or something. No one will say yeah. that it happened. Yeah. But there are certainly a lot of people in China that know that it happened. I but guess they know not to say it. One generation later or two it's like, that's done. Like, if you can just extinguish the idea of a gener- uh Is it? You don't think don't parents think so? tell their kids? Man, my parents didn't really tell me much about the 60s or... I think it might be different when it's Tiananmen Square. Maybe. I don't know. I think that... I mean, here's the truth. Buddhist monk, we'll see. Yeah. I think it's too early to tell that... China, to say that China's attempt to rewrite history has been successful, mm-hmm. TBD. Yeah. And I also don't want to uh, make them out to be the only country that rewrites and controls the narrative. Of course, this is oh, the U.S. does too. I read this uh, is occurring everywhere. What was it called? Something of an economic hitman? Confessions yeah, yeah, of an yeah, economic yeah. hitman. That is a history book you don't find in public school. And that, again, that that one I find fascinating. I have the waters have been very muddied with that. People have criticized him. He has denied the criticisms. Mm-hmm. He says that it was the case. Who knows? But the, the when did you read it? By the way, it was a while was ago. Twenty five. Oh, it was a while ago. I was Got in Las it. Vegas the first Got time. It. I just didn't know if you'd recently hmm. like remembered a bunch of it. Anyways, what else you got? Uh, this this is just a uh, stoic quote that I found that I liked. It's do not seek to have events happen as you want them, but instead want them to happen as they do and your life will go well. So I think that it makes sense to try to conquer the world in your 20s. I don't think necessarily you have to start doing this from day one. But at this point, personally, I would like to live like that. Mm-hmm. Do you have any suggestions? Because that is absolutely not how I <laughs> I live where I seek events to happen the way I want them yeah, to. Yeah, I want to yeah. control the world, be the master of my own universe, and I will be disappointed or angry or sad if things don't go the way I want. Yeah. Any advice? Because it definitely sounds like if you sounds just awesome. want them to happen <laughs> as they do, you're in a good place. I don't know. So everything that I give is from someone who doesn't live like that <laughs> okay. i don't know i just know you've studied a lot of emotional mastery the only thing that i've and yeah, that stuff. where i'm closer to that i'll say when i'm interacting with the world when i'm trying to grow my business or mm-hmm. or like uh visualizing the future that takes me farther from that when i am quiet and uh potentially microdosing i've been talking but mm-hmm. like uh when i'm internal is when i find peace with what is mm-hmm. So yeah, the more that I'm, and for me, it's, I'm not thrust into World War III. It's not really hard with my external surroundings to choose to go internal. I just choose not to sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'll just spend like two weeks not laying down quietly and instead wanting to win in League of Legends, which we've been playing and I'm fucking toxic at. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I was was actually going to ask you that. So for me, where I see it for myself is I want my videos to do well. And when I don't do well, I am wishing that they would do better. Yeah. And then even in my purest joy, which is surfing, if I botch a wave, I will have wished to Hit have it. done better. And yeah. I, see, I see in you that maybe it's less fun to lose at a video game with your friends than to win it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do we do about that? <laughs> my honest to God, and I wish I had a better thing. I think there's a couple of practices that help. Uh, one is like removing stimuli that are destructive to you and so we've talked about the dashboards like not i haven't logged into youtube Mm -hmm. in weeks and i get the idea that our last two videos were complete fucking duds yeah yeah, they weren't good but well i think they were good but it's not it's not staring me in the face yeah so that's one that is like we each had a dud video you probably have cared more than i have because as soon as i learned it was a dud i'm like this is off limits to my eyes like i'm not going in here um and i want to i just want to um What is it? Sort of, this isn't simply avoidance of a truth and I'm going to pretend it's not the case. I know the video bombed. 
I just also recognize I have no more growth by reiterating that point and like checking the numbers every day. Like I, I have come to terms with the fact that that video did not su succeed on the level that I wanted to as regards views. Yeah. Like I'm not denying that. So I'm not saying to run from your problems or anything. I'm just no, saying no. don't don't belabor them and well, I'm my, past well, that here's, point. Here's my goal though. Be okay when a million people watch the Craig Ferguson video on how to flirt. Yeah. Because that's great. And be okay when 100,000 people watch the Conor McGregor video because that's okay. Well, you said and it. Have man. fun when we win League of Legends and have fun when we lose League of Legends because either way. You got to give away the ups is I think the problem. Yeah. You're like, you want to be okay? Well, then be okay with 3 million views in a day. Don't be great. Don't be wonderful. Be okay. That's the hard part mm. is like when you're riding high, when you're winning, be like, this doesn't matter mm. because if this matters, then it's opposite then is bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like when you have a great success and you're killing it, I do think it's important. And I try to like partially, not with video games, but with videos to be like, this doesn't matter. Mm. This doesn't matter. It didn't matter when it was 10 of 10 and it doesn't matter when it's one of 10. Um, you think that's the only way? Detach from both? No, I haven't gotten there. So if somebody has gotten there, they're a better uh, source than me. Mm. Uh, and then I've mentioned it, but I, it's the only thing that I know that creates like deep transformation is inner work, some of which we discuss in emotional mastery and is facilitated for me increasingly by microdosing and, and those sorts of experiences, mm. but plus time because it's like, that's like a sprinkle and then you need time to like adjust to a new potential way of being. But yeah, I'm not there. Got it. Separate topic related on happiness. I'm reading mm -hmm. that book, The Happiness Hypothesis. I got, they have a formula. I'm still reading the book, so I'm sure I'll have more to add, but I thought it was interesting. He, the one thing, I, the one critique I have with the book is he says that he has a difference of opinion from the Buddha, but then says things. He's like, yeah, like for instance, this is something the Buddha wouldn't agree with. And I don't think, I just think he doesn't understand yeah. what the Buddha would want, but I still think it's, it's a good book and it's been interesting. So he says happiness, it's basically a combination of your happiness set point that we all have. You got what you got genetically. Some people are just happy no matter what their circumstances are. And some people are just miserable, no matter what their circumstances are. But you control what you can control. And so then there's the set point, your conditions and your voluntary activities. And what I thought was interesting is specifically, there's some bad conditions that you never adapt to. So do you know hedonic adaptation? Yeah, yeah. Basically, you win the lottery or you get paralyzed. You revert to how happy you were prior to that event after, I think it's 30 days or 90 days. It might be 90. With some small like maybe you're a little bit happier a little bit sadder yeah but there's some things that actually just make you unhappy yeah all the time you never adapt to it and so they are uh bad noises so if you live where really? a garbage truck wakes you up at four in the morning every day it will annoy you the 90th time in a row that it happens interesting yeah Heavy traffic, which is funny because everybody in LA just constantly complains about the traffic. Because even if you have the same commute, and for this two is, years, I assume this is based on like surveys or like, mm -hmm, yeah, they do, they do uh, self reported happiness. Okay. It's the only way they can capture happiness. Yeah, it's as good as they can get. Uh, sometimes they do brain scans, but not on this. This one I thought was interesting daily insecurities, like acne. When you look in the mirror, just it just bothers. And I, I noticed this because I had acne for years. You know, that's funny. I agree. It haunt, I had, so did I. It was fucking every day, man. Yeah, the third it's year the of third, having oh, bad acne. God. I dude, so I tried not to go on Accutane because I thought it was bad. So I had very bad ac acne from the moment I moved into college. I actually didn't have it in high school, which is weird. From eighteen until twenty three. Yeah, and the thing that broke me was when I heard people talking about it because I had headphones in, but that wasn't listening to music and I was on a train. Oh, so I'm God. five years in, still insecure about it. And it was interesting to read in this book. Yeah, these these things don't stop bothering you, which is weird because I guess if you get paralyzed, it does stop bothering you. I don't really understand. So what I'll say is with the daily insecurities, and I just want to round it out, which is there are people that think like, you know, oh, I don't, uh, I'm flat chested. If I only had bigger boobs, then that would go away. And it's like, maybe that that's the case. But there's also people that uh, are assigning an insecurity to a particular physical feature and it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. And those become the type of people that get addicted to surgeries and uh, modification and improvement and glamour and beauty. But I will say when my when my acne got cleared up, that insecurity was like 
way way yeah, yeah, didn't, gone didn't like move. yes it didn't go to like oh no like i wanted to be stronger but i wanted to be stronger just as much and it wasn't like something i looked in the mirror and yeah. was concerned with in well the, same the big way. thing for me I, was i was thinking like these are things to try to control in your life yeah, so yeah. for instance he says a mistake people make people will move far from their jobs to get a bigger house and then deal with a bad commute and you get used to your bigger house that's you, something you yep. do hedonically yep. adapt to but you don't get used to the the shitty commute. So I feel like I internalized that years common, ago. Yeah, a common predictable mistake that people voluntarily make a lot is to go live in the I'll suburbs and go drive in the, the suburbs, city. get the big house, stop caring about the big house within ninety days, hate your commute every day. So he's like, live close to work, get a smaller place, get you remote will, work, you get will remote get work. Yeah. yeah. So I thought that was interesting. The other ones, just real quick, uh, a relationship with constant fights. He says people, you just don't adapt to you will be stressed if you and your wife get in a fight five years in it will make you angry and you'll so what i i agree and i think unfortunately what happens is you it becomes water so like even though you're unhappy and now three years ago you would have said you were average a seven out of ten and now you say you're a four out of ten you just learn to live with the four out of ten oh, yeah. it's like i am self-reporting no, at lower. i'm not yeah, saying yeah. people get out of bad relationships yeah yeah i'm saying the fights still make you aggravated yeah five years in yeah yeah Whereas when you're in the lottery, the joy you feel does not last for five Your hundred million dollars, even if it the grows. The euphoria yeah. you have the day you win the lottery does not yeah, maintain. For sure. But the aggravation of fighting with a loved one. That matches my experience for will sure. Will maintain. Uh, and then the last one is financial stress around food. He says the more money doesn't always make you happier. But if you don't know where your food is going to come from and you have food insecurity, that that is something that is is hard to adapt to it's interesting. basically um so yes yeah, so someone with a high enough set point can still be happy through all of this someone who has good voluntary activities the third part of the formula can still be happy through all this so these do not guarantee you're unhappy they just are making you less happy mm -hmm. that's what that's what he says at least and then good voluntary activity uh, activities that according to him are meditation cognitive behavior therapy flow inducing activities including sports art or writing Meals with people that you enjoy their company of. He says these are things that you can do that will have a sustained effect on your happiness. Whereas if you, I don't know, eat ice cream, you're happy while you're eating it, but then immediately stop. These are things that make you happier for the next several hours. They, they, yeah. they stick. They're a little bit sticky. Yeah. So yeah. I thought that was interesting. It's just for like, several okay. hours, it sounds like. So avoid the bad conditions. Try to do voluntary activities and... There you go. That's your best. That's your best recipe for happiness. And uh, which is not. This is within the sphere of your normal type person reporting this. Like your Dalai Lama is going to have a different. He's an aberrant person and is perhaps going to recommend. He's like, forget the conditions. Like just do the meditation. But yeah, uh, if for your average person living a, a life with a commute and a family and fights mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, that that tracks with with my experience for sure. So yeah, I thought that was interesting. That's all I got. I'll let you guys know if I read anything else. Here <laughs> but I just wanted to share that. I was like, oh, this is cool. When I listen to podcasts, I, that's what I, that's the kind of stuff I want people to share. Are you going to change anything? Well, I actually feel like I got really lucky in that I have a lot of the conditions mm -hmm. pretty, pretty chill. Uh, but I'm hoping that the book will get into more practical stuff. But nothing, yeah. nothing has come of it so far, except for me making the whiteboard again and trying yeah. to remind myself to surf, have calls with friends stretch read yeah. and meditate so that's where the whiteboard came from was was reading this good news bad news for you and i and it's it's like we talk about first mountain second mountain it's like we've done it like we did we did a lot of these things we controlled our conditions we work from home this is awesome thank you guys <laughs> this is super cool by the way I'm, I'm gonna pause here uh we had a fantastic month in january uh not like patrons were super helpful as always but we actually had a couple of jordan belfort clips that took off so we did oh, good in nice. adsense so we are going to do a dungeons and dragons one shot mm. i think for our patrons maybe you care maybe you don't it'll be my first time ever playing dungeons and dragons ben's kind of dabbled in role play before yeah when i was 13 uh but if this works we want to invite guests on so i'm gonna like learn the rule set we're gonna get it all set up but we would ideally one day have like uh guests of different backgrounds coming on who you may recognize and play yeah, we'll Dungeons get and Dragons. Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson <laughs> in there as an elf and a warlock as an elf and a warlock so we'll we're uh, gonna do that that's coming up pretty soon uh, and there's a video in the Patreon for those of you who haven't seen it that is related to YouTube. It's a 45 minute talk that I did for a like a group of marketers, but I wanted to give it to those of you who are not going to be able to participate in 
the YouTube call, which by the way, Justin has reached out to those of you via your channels because I'm an idiot and forgot to capture emails in the form that we put up <laughs> last week. So Justin has dropped a line. Have people been responding? Yeah, so YouTube took away the direct messaging feature. So oh. I literally just had to comment on their recent video. Okay, so uh, I can't take everybody. We, got it. we had a lot of interest, which is great. I think I'm gonna do two calls. Check your comment sections for, is it Justin? Is it Charlie in Bed podcast? Yeah, it's the, the podcast channel. Cool. If, uh, just check your comment section if you if you did that. For some of you, I was able to capture your email because I realized my mistake and, I'll, and we'll email you directly. So that's the Patreon podcast update. But yeah, it was a good month in January. I forget nice. where we were that that was a divergent. No, we were done. Okay. We're on to new stuff. You got uh, some? The last thing that I just, I don't, all I can say about this is that it's going to be super interesting in 30 years with clear eyes and uh, the politics sort of mostly settled to mm. see how Corona. the vastly different approaches to coronavirus are viewed. Yeah. Um, you, will you tell people, because I don't think people know unless they know international people. Yeah, yeah. Will you tell about your friend who is a doctor who lives in Brazil sure. compared to our friend who lives in Canada? Yeah. And so we're, so there's all I these. Think people know what's happening in their own countries. If you're mm -hmm. in the U.S., you know the U.S. If you're in Amsterdam, you know Amsterdam. But these two are so yeah. divergent. Well, even policy. within the U.S., it's like if you're in Florida, you don't know what it's like in California. I promise you. It's yeah. it's, it's way more locked down. But uh, so we've but got Canada. We've got a buddy in Canada who uh, he's, he's works with us. He's our our I don't even know what his role is anymore. Um, he's our guy. He's our guy. <laughs> and he he uh, came down. We had a we had some work stuff that we were doing here. He went back to Canada, had to quarantine for 14 days. Mm -hmm. He was made to download an app that uh, he couldn't delete off his phone for $10,000 fine. And a policeman came to his house every single day to check that he was quarantined. And did the cop actually come? Yes, every single day. Wow. In addition, uh, he told me Montreal had martial law to locking it down. And in his province, I think it's called Ontario, they had barricaded the highways. Like you were not allowed to drive on the highway. So you can't go from city to city. You can't go long periods of time. So that's one approach, yeah. Canada. I mean, there's obviously you, Korea, I believe they had contact tracing and have been mostly open throughout this time. You've got the US, which we know. And then we were looking at Brazil, considering visiting, contacted someone I know who's a doctor who was in the hospital for coronavirus like they were watching people die um in the beginning got coronavirus in march you know was just was just surrounded by this stuff uh now it's the brazilian summer and i asked what's going on like you know our gym's open and they laughed they're like what do you mean our gym's open like gyms gyms didn't close like yeah. nothing ever closed no you asked if we could go to the beach because in la they and then the i got a photo of the beach packed yeah. just packed no masks no nothing i was like is there nightlife and then later on from a bar this is a doctor <laughs> a crowded bar of people i was like what about masks uh and apparently the rule is when you enter a venue you like wear the mask and then you just take it off yeah. when you're inside well, now this is rio de janeiro brazil from the perspective of one individual and i'm not saying that that's right wrong or anything i'm just blown away by the variety of approaches to the pandemic and i don't know in terms of um lives lost suffering by like potential scarring in the lungs economic drains suicides and and loss of uh despair i have no idea how it's going to shake out who's handled it well who's yeah. handled it poorly well i think the the thing that they should do is just 10 years from now look back on deaths over the course of the 10 years and yeah. say did corona i mean it's weird but basically will there be a lot less deaths in the looser countries in the next couple of years because the people that died were the elderly mm -hmm. or the sick. Or will you see a huge spike in those countries and then the same amount of deaths you would have expected without a pandemic in those years? Yeah. Because that'll really teach you a lot about what is happening actually yeah. with the deaths that are occurring or that did occur, I guess, in 2020. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. What charities do is they have qualities, Q-A-L-Y-S, which are like quality averaged life years mm -hmm. where they, um, because when you're choosing between what charity to give to, there's, how do you know? And one of the ways that they try to compare things is like, okay, this charity um, helps the blind and like they, they then have an improved life. Mm -hmm. So it's not that they're living longer, but the average quality of their life is increasing. So we can assign some number to that. This charity provides malaria nets. So it's preventing, it's giving someone 40 years that they might not have had. Um, and that's how they begin. And it's not the only thing life, life years, but it, it, it helps you account for the quality of life and the length of it. And then just 
mm-hmm. get a number. Um, so that's one way that they might begin to like look at this is to go, you know, how many qualies were lost with an economic lockdown approach where not as many people died, but their average standards of living died and yeah. some people committed suicide and some people got depressed. And unfortunately, to your point, not everyone pursues truth. So yeah. my impression is that even among in the U.S., certain states are doing less testing because they just don't yeah. want to deal with Corona and other states are doing a lot of testing because they think it's really important. So then they're going to report more cases, but they might not necessarily have more cases per capita. Yeah, yeah. So we, I don't even know if we have captured the data to do that study. We may never know yeah. what the real impact of Corona was. I th- Yeah. So it's I'm just curious how it shakes out. I feel confident that uh, whatever the U.S. did was not the best because we seem to have had the worst of not the worst, a very bad part of both worlds, which is like the shutdowns shut down. plus mass deaths. scale deaths, yeah. which is like we really just whiffed yeah. <laughs> on this one. Um, but yeah, so I don't I don't know which way is right or wrong. I just was I it's remarkable yeah. how different approaches are. I was about to ask you a question that there's no way you can know the answer to. So <laughs> never mind. It's all pass. Anything else that you had? Oh, well, we've got a talk with Street, Street Epistemologists, Epistemology. right? Yep. So do, should we just hop into that and then do no YouTube questions, just Patreon questions? No, I only have Patreon questions. Okay, so let's let's hop into the interview and then we'll do Patreon questions. Cool. We have a conversation coming up and afterwards, patrons. Peace. We are here with Anthony Magnabosco. He has a YouTube channel called Street Epistemology where he goes out and discusses with people, why they believe the things that they believe. And I'll give you just a second to intro it. What is it in your eyes and uh, why do you do it? Whew. Well, street epistemology is essentially a communication technique that seems to be really effective in helping people take a look at their views in a way that they don't normally take a look at their views. We don't often reflect on how we form the view and what it would take to change our mind. And that's what street epistemology is. It's largely asking questions, trying to take yourself out of it as much as possible and make the focus about them and their belief formation process. Mm -hmm. Uh, As far as my motivations, I want to live in a world where people believe as many true things as possible, or they at least strive to, Mm -hmm. because we can see the effect of walking around with beliefs that are probably not true. We're encountering that on almost a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is probably one way to not only improve the interactions that we're having with people that we fundamentally disagree with, but to try to make the world a little bit of a better place. Sure. So epistemology, I'm a philosophy major. That's something that I encountered in undergrad, Ah. but it's not a word that most people are familiar with. So how did you Mm -hmm. even get into, most people don't ask, why do I believe the things that I believe? And how did you even come across epistemology? Why, why is it of interest? I know why it's of interest to you, but why was it initially of interest to you? Mm. Well, it was initially interesting and it wasn't because of the word. And I, mm-hmm. I, I just, the word street and you throw epistemology onto it. It loads a lot of misconceptions, I think, as mm-hmm. far as what we're doing. Right. Street epistemology is the study of knowledge. I don't think I even was really that aware of that term until I discovered a book called A Manual for Creating Atheists. Mm-hmm. And then there's been a subsequent book called How to Have Impossible Conversations, which purports to having like techniques for having better conversations with people that we disagree with. And so I was skeptical when I read the book and I, in a way kind of set out to show that it either worked or didn't. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I went out with my camera and started having conversations to see, can I ask questions about people's deeply held beliefs and see if they'll reflect on them, maybe show a degree of shift in confidence that it's really true. And uh, what I didn't really expect is that it would change. It changed me actually. Now I, I think I've, I think I've become a little bit more humble about what I can say that I know. Mm. And that's been sort of a liberating thing too, to be comfortable with uncertainty. I think I've become a lot more comfortable with uncertainty over the years by having done this approach. Yeah. What's a belief that you had when you started and that talking to other people has helped to soften or change? Because I know a lot of times Mm -hmm. they'll come in and have a belief in God or whatever it might be. And then you are softening their belief. But has it ever happened in reverse where someone actually had points that made you change your mind? There have been a few times where I've had conversations, sometimes with people on the street, other times over Facebook Messenger or something like that, where where um, I've surfaced a claim. In fact, I, I tend to be a little bit more careful about the claims that I make now because I'm surrounded by a lot of people who use this approach. <laughs> <laughs> but to, but to well, you do your open question, yourself up for challenge when you're the challenge guy. For exactly. But, but uh, let's see. I, th- I think I've softened on gun control. I used to be really vehemently against walking around like open carry 
showing a weapon, Mm -hmm. bringing them into buildings, campuses, Mm -hmm. churches, schools. I don't go to a lot of churches, but I ended up speaking with a lot of people who ended up giving really good reasons and verifiable methods for why that position is actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's been a, an eye opening thing. Other, other things too, like the idea of downloading music for free and not paying the artist. I was really against that idea. Oh, interesting. But after having a few conversations with people, it ended up putting a pebble into my shoe and it caused me to think about it. And once you realize that you really can't justify some of these views, it tends to back off, uh, tends to back you off on sure. your confidence that it's really true. What's the counter? Because I actually understand. I, I'm similar with gun mm. control where when I grew up in my super safe suburban East Coast North area that all hated guns. I was like, yeah, guns are obviously bad. And then as I've just lived life and experienced other things that changed my mind. But what is the music argument for why it's OK to take music without compensating the musicians? Right. Because I'm surprised and I, by that. Be, <laughs> right. And to be clear, I try to view my my beliefs that the truth of my beliefs in terms of a confidence scale, like from zero to 100 or something. So okay. I'm not hard and fast on that. I'm, and in fact, I'm willing to, to shift. I think the argument that, that I heard that was pretty convincing is that, that an artist who makes their material available to the public uh, casts a wider net, so to speak, and could actually end up bringing in more income as a result of giving away some things for free or not even giving them away, but having them shared publicly like that. Mm. Got it. Well, that's a big difference, right? I think if an artist wanted to give something away for free by their volition in order to get famous, then I would support that. But mm. it's, I think for the consumer yeah. to make that decision make on their that behalf for them <laughs> seems a bit right. self-serving, a little bit of self-sabotage. Oh, I'm doing this for because it's good for them. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like you're justifying stealing. But but what, well, if I had to come up with this, with a supporting <laughs> right. argument for it, it would be that uh, intellectual property rights are as as are all laws, very arbitrary, right? I think one of the things that you see is you dive into like, why do we have the laws that we have and the rights that we have is that not all of them have uh, axioms that you would necessarily agree with. Like the idea that something that comes out of your brain is yours in perpetuity, uh, despite the fact that you could hum a tune and somebody else can immediately capture it and hum it back. It's, mm. uh, it's not obvious that that belongs to someone. So if, if I had to make the argument as to why that ought to be allowed it would it would come from the arbitrary nature of our intellectual property laws which seem to be set entirely by disney corporation these days <laughs> just extending, indeed, and extending. Indeed. um so so you mentioned uh, a couple of things that i thought were interesting one that you immediately went out to test this method which is like so meta with what you're doing because the whole sequence of questions that i often hear you ask is can you test that is this provable if the, what kind of test would one want to run. So it sounds like you already kind of mm. had a germ of uh, like healthy skepticism in inside of you. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. Like I was skeptical that this approach could do the things that the author was purporting that it could do, that you can go out, surface a claim or, or even wait till somebody makes a claim. Ideally, these conversations can organically start. Mm-hmm. So I was going out and initiating talks and bringing my camera so that I could record myself doing this. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to see if it worked, if, if it was resulting in people thinking about their views, maybe lowering their confidence in their claim or, and, and then what did they think about the conversation afterwards? Were they interested in talking with me again? Were they willing to send other people up to me to talk to me? The, the great thing is people were enjoying the talks. They mm-hmm. were thinking about their views. They were shifting in terms of their confidence. Mm-hmm. And even bringing other people up to talk about a variety of different topics. So, so that was encouraging. However, a lot of this is just anecdotal. This is a, a, if, probably a few thousand people now. I'd say I'd say we're probably at ten thousand, maybe wow. maybe fifty thousand people who are aware of this approach and they're having conversations where they use this, mm-hmm. and they are self-reporting those types of things. But yeah. we really need to get this into the lab. We need to scientifically test this and see. Is it doing, is it a more productive form of engagement on difficult topics? Mm -hmm. My sense is that it is. However, being a skeptic myself, we want to test this. We want to, I would love to put people in, into uh, MRI machines or something and, Mm -hmm. and monitor their brain waves. I don't know exactly know how we do it, but I would love to get to the point where we can actually do so. That's interesting. So uh, maintaining the anecdotal experience, what, what I can safely say anecdotally and i think is widely held belief is that some of the hardest people to speak to are the ones that you know and love your family members are oftentimes less likely to amend a belief 
uh, in front of you than a complete stranger on a college campus. And I'm curious if I assume that that's because of some emotional ties. So two questions. One, do you, have you seen and share that? And how is it when you have uh, tense discussions with people that you know and love? Are you the street epistemologist or do you go on tilt mm. like I do? Uh, <laughs> and and uh, I, I just I just talk a little bit about the importance of the emotional threads and connections, because I know that one of the things I've seen you do is be very respectful and even log the times when you're not when you when mm. you interrupt someone, because it seems that you recognize how important that sense of respect is to creating a space in which someone can safely change their mind. Yes, yeah, those are some really good ideas. So I, I have found that it's a little bit easier and this might sound counterintuitive. You would think that if you are using this approach with somebody that you know, mm -hmm. that you're familiar with or who knows your background, where you've even established trust, that it might be an easier conversation. However, but what I found <laughs> is that I've had much more productive conversations with total strangers on extremely difficult topics. Mm -hmm. And I have suspicions as to why that might be the case. I, I think perhaps it's because of that history that you've had with that person. And maybe they do know where you stand or that you disagree with them. My experience is that strangers who have no idea who you are, if you can establish that level of trust and show that you do respect them emotionally, you're listening to them, you're hearing them out, and you're not interrupting them as much as you possibly can, People respond to that. And I think if they feel safe and listened to, and they they feel that they're in a trusting environment, you're going to have some amazing talks with them. That is a higher hurdle, though, I think, with family members for some strange reason. It might almost be better to let your your friends or strangers do the SE, the street epistemology on your family members, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I've done it with family and I've even had some family members say, are you doing that street epistemology stuff with me? <laughs> they, they tend to be it. a little bit defensive about Dude, it. Imagine because running I think a they charisma can see thing. <laughs> we, run, we run a company called Charisma on Command. It's constantly, are you doing the charisma thing on me? Like, I don't know. Existing? You ever get that? Yeah, yeah all the time. Yeah. <laughs> all the time. When I, when I want to change people's minds, what I've learned, the closer they are to me, I have to refer them to the primary text. So there was a point in my life where I decided because of the book, The 4-Hour Workweek, the nine to five is bust. I got to quit. I got to leave my job, travel the world, start my own business. And I told everyone about it. And it was immediate collapsing backlash, not at all interested in hearing me discuss the book. But to the people that I was able to get, will you please just read the first chapter? They were, again, anecdotally influenced at a much higher rate. Mm -hmm. So I can't, I, I, I share that experience that Something about the history, and especially if you're if you have um, there's an established power dynamic, and it's and there's there's a give and a take, and we don't want it to switch too much. And if I completely upend my father's belief system, that's a very different power dynamic between the father son power dynamic that we've had in the past. Yeah. But if Tim Ferriss changes his mind, established New York Times number one best selling author, that's very different. So there's a degree of authority, I think that. Um, that I try mm. to lean on when I'm when I'm trying to change people's minds. I give them to Sam Harris instead mm. of talking to them myself. Yeah, so I think a lot of people do think that I can simply give this this my conversation partner, this person that I disagree with, this person that I, I'm hoping that they'll take another look at their views. If I direct them to an authoritative source that they'll actually listen or read it, <laughs> that it will impact them in some way and that they'll honestly reevaluate their views and maybe lower their confidence. Generally speaking, that doesn't seem mm. to work. Um, sometimes people do respond to that if they're observing it like as a third party, maybe they pull up a YouTube video or something. Sure. That's been my experience. But giving somebody something that contradicts what they think is true can often result in them beca becoming more guarded and ignoring the evidence that you're giving them. And that's that's one of the, the main fundamental thrusts of street epistemology, I think, is, listen, I don't want to give you anything. I want to, and I, I, don't give me anything that you think will convince me that you're right. I want to understand how you became convinced. So can you walk me through your step? through your process. Let's go with your definitions of words. Mm -hmm. So this is all about taking yourself out of it and going with what, what they think, because it's their view that you're exploring. Mm. And it is hard to resist giving people evidence or a, a really compelling article or a link to a video because you found it compelling, but you're taking a chance. You, you, you don't know for sure that they will respond to it in the same way that you did. Interesting. What so is your formula it sounds like you have you have kind of a clear idea of how to best do this how would you mm. instruct let's say that i have 
people in my life who have political opinions that seem harmful to them and untrue. Can you arm me to have a conversation with them to help them maybe get to a place that's more true and therefore or better for them to help you realize the, yeah. <laughs> the veracity of sure. their claims? It goes absolutely because <laughs> it goes both ways for yeah. sure. So th- th- I hate to say that there's a formula or a script, but there are some rough guidelines because mm-hmm. when you go out and do this enough, you start noticing a pattern or if you've watched 5, 10, 20 street epistemology videos, you may start anticipating the questions that we might ask. It's not to say that uh, there's a script that you can follow because you should go where your conversation partner takes you Mm -hmm. and you want to be authentic also. That being said, though, there is some benefit to having a few guidelines. My, My first suggestion would be, well, number one, ask yourself what your motivations are. Why do you even care? Why do you care to engage with this person on this topic? Is it to change their mind? Is it to learn something? Is it to help them take another look at their views? And and that goal can change mid-conversation. Uh, the other thing, I, maybe the second part is make sure that you isolate the specific claim because sometimes people will give claim after claim after claim. And then by the time you're ready to start asking questions to explore, you're not even sure what you're exploring. Or the thing that I think I'm exploring is different than what they think that they're exploring. Yeah. So make sure that you isolate a specific claim. Sometimes they'll even say something like, can you, can you tell me your claim as if you were writing a tweet? Mm-hmm. Can you just nail it down to this? And they say, well, when it comes down to it, I think that karma is real and it's an influencing force on humanity. Mm-hmm. Perfect. We've got a really nice claim. That's not a political claim, but you can use this approach with anything, whether it's about QAnon or mask usage or God's existing or whatever. So isolate the claim and then work out all of your definitions. Yeah. And when I say when I say that, use their definitions. Mm-hmm. Ask them what they mean by these words and go with it for the point for the purpose of the conversation. That'd be my second thing. I see. So do you want to jump in there while? I, while yeah, I go yeah. To so that? I see. I see you writing stuff down often on the on that clipboard. Are you writing mm-hmm. definitions down? Because uh, that's sometimes one of, okay. Because that seems like an important thing to track. As I pay attention to my own Mm. conversations you know racism is a big discussion and it always breaks down to somebody says racism means one thing and somebody else says it means another and never they never get to it so it seems um Mm. very helpful to solidify and come back to you know even instead of just using that simplified word let's just use the string of words that you used so as to not get lost in the the this amorphous word that we don't even agree upon what it means generally yeah, because you may find that by their de- definition of that word or any word in particular, you may start to realize, oh, we're actually closer together mm-hmm, on this mm-hmm. than I had realized. I thought we were really further apart. And just the definition alone sometimes can cause somebody to, th- to think about their views mm-hmm. and become less sure of what they think is true. Mm-hmm. So, but that's also, that's not written in stone. Just because I'm writing it down doesn't mean that we can't revisit that or change it. I was that say- often happens. People say, you know, I'm thinking about it. Let's, let's add this onto that definition. Mm-hmm. So that's completely fine. So, so you're not that trying out. to Another nail thing anybody. I try to do. It, lo- it oh, sounds like, please. It, it sounds like you're not trying, you're not trying to gotcha anybody. One of the things is, nope. is if somebody provides a definition and I'm guilty of this, I will hold them to that definition and then mm. uh, nail them to that cross <laughs> yeah, and, the and destroy them with their own definition the because I want to win. And because it's a uh, oh, you know, egoic superior that goes thing. To the, that goes to the first thing I was saying, right? <laughs> so like if your motivation is to win and destroy yeah. and to show that you're right and, and destroy them, then I might ask that you just set street epistemology aside <laughs> sure. and just debate with them. <laughs> exactly. All right? But some, sometimes street epistemology is a tool that you can use to bring people to the point of wondering about their views where maybe they're more open to accepting other ideas. Mm-hmm. And you could use it then, you could go a step further than what we, what we try to advocate in street epistemology. And, and then you try to actually promote your, your perspective. Mm-hmm. Usually by the end of the conversation though, I know we're getting a little bit off track here, but usually by the end of the conversation, because you've listened to them so much and you've taken such care to understand them, by the time that it rolls around for you to give your point of view, they're often mimicking what you've just done with them. Mm -hmm. So that makes it more productive. Then you can really communicate your message in a very open way without those usual encumbrances that will come up if you debate with them. Yeah. That's awesome. Let's, can we, can we do some now? Yeah, absolutely. What kind of claim you want to, Ooh, we want to so, explore. So uh, we have Justin. If you would like to participate, let us know. So here's what I'll say. I uh, 
I am very soft in a lot of my beliefs. I have low confidence, so I might not be the most interesting. Do you have do you have high? I don't really matter. I believe I want to change. Okay. I, I think that eating mammals is wrong, and I would absolutely love if you could talk <laughs> me back into eating mammals. <laughs> oh, so the, so we can do um. um so so little... we don't need to talk back. Okay, so I'll give you a handful, and, and it could be we share a lot of the same beliefs. So one is um about what types of food are appropriate to eat. My belief is that certainly not other mammals for me. And if you have disorders where you cannot process plants, I, I exclude you from this. Um, potentially fish, which is where I'm like, I'm not really sure. Um, higher degree of confidence in mollusks, clams, uh, snails, hmm. that sort of thing. And I would say 99% confidence in plants. Um, okay. So that would be one. Uh, That's a good way. We can go with that, I think. Okay. And if, well, so should we do, we have oh. slightly different beliefs on this. So should we do Ben or me or, or both of us? Uh, the topic is the same. Same topic. Yeah. Same topic. Yes. Yeah. Let's, let's try it. Why okay. not? Great. I've, I've interviewed two people once, Great. so let's do it. All right. I'm excited. <laughs> so how do we start? Hmm. Well, first I'd probably make sure that we're on the same page with regards to terms. I'd probably make an attempt to repeat back what I think I just heard you say. So I might say something like, all right, Charlie, at least from my understanding, uh, you you have a, a sliding scale when it comes to the type of creature that you're willing to eat. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? correct? Do I have that right? Correct. And furthermore, the it's not necessarily about the eating. It's about the treatment of that creature while alive. So if I, okay. if I stumbled across a dead, healthy cow, I'd be fine with making hamburgers out of, out of that meat. It's about the treatment while alive. And, well, okay, and, you so would, that, and you wouldn't kill the cow. And about the act of killing, yes. But if you just mm -hmm. found a dead cat, if, <laughs> I a just cow, found if a cow had a heart attack, <laughs> I actually was going to ask you this, if a cow had a heart oh, yeah. attack in the woods, 100%. you would eat it. If it was healthy. A natural heart attack, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was yeah. just something, a yes. bolt of lightning scared it. Okay, I was curious because I, I would, but yes. I, I didn't know yes. if you would. And how about you, Ben? I'm the same on that. I, I think. With, oh, with, you're the same. You're with, on the same page with that. Okay. It's just the sliding um, scale. Ben Ben eats uh, poultry, right? Or, or mm -hmm. yes. got. It. Was this an evolving idea? Like, were, did you always have this view, or is this something that you've you've adopted over time? Can you tell so me a little is, bit about that, each of you? This is very recent. This is as of three years ago. Before that, I just you know had the same diet as the water around me. Mm -hmm. You know, so everybody eats everything, and so I ate everything. And then we were flying from LA or from New York or Philly to LA mm -hmm. and we watched the movie 12 years a slave and one of the themes of the movie is that there's a good slave owner there's a guy who's bible loving and wants to treat his slaves well despite the fact that he beats them when necessary quote unquote and afterwards Charlie asked me what today's slavery is because it's not reasonable to assume that there was this huge moral failing back then but now we're in this utopia and there's no moral failing today. And the thing that we came to from brainstorming is factory farming of cows, cows and pigs, mm. and these animals who are just as smart as dogs, more or less, who not just get eaten, but get treated atrociously. And then from there, it kind of evolved to the other areas that I consider gray. So I feel in terms of confidence to what you spoke on, I feel very confident that the factory farming of cows and pigs will be looked on as an absolute moral failing of our time. Whereas mm -hmm. bow hunting a deer, I don't, you know, I actually am, I'm pretty wishy-washy on that. If Joe Rogan wants to come on and tell me that bow hunting a deer is moral, <laughs> it's like, well, I don't know. I, I would be mad if you came in and shot my dog and ate it, but <laughs> I, we are omnivores in circle of life. And people think sometimes I, you'll hear people say that nature is so beautiful with the exception of man and nature is absolutely horrifically brutal in a lot of ways as well. So I am, le I have less confidence in that argument about the bow hunting of a deer or catching a fish with a fishing rod but mm. it, it's mostly about that slaughterhouse okay. well i want to just i like to just point out a couple of things that i that i was doing there that you may maybe you didn't notice maybe you did sure. i was listening to you i wasn't interrupting you um i didn't really ask for clarification of terms because you know we're kind of on a time constraint here, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. But, and we all know what a cow is. <laughs> but it, yeah, if there's any confusion about terms, I would have surfaced them and said, okay, how are you defining that word? Um, I also resisted, not that I had facts to give you, but if I had some facts to show you, one thing that I think we tend to do is we immediately think that all I just need to give these guys is some information to show mm -hmm. that, well, these animals are treated better than you think that they are, or, or that... Uh, 
they're not really feeling as much pain as you think you are. There was this great mm -hmm. study that came out three years ago that you have to see. Yeah. I need to really ask you about your reasons and what you would allow to influence your overall confidence. Mm. So I might ask an eliminator question to the extent of something like, you know, if we discover together that there was a way to treat animals humanely in a, in a factory setting and still consume them, would you be open to eating them at that point? It is less about the fact that they're in a building that's called a factory. It's actually not about that at all. It's about the pain and suffering that comes with that in my understanding of today's farming facilities. But mm -hmm. yeah, if they if, the, if you, they had a giant the size of a uh, two acres factory, you know, it was just a roof over two acres where they all ran around and that was called factory farming. Then, yeah, that's fine by me. I, I would have a different belief there. I, I think what informs a lot of my beliefs is an aim for moral consistency. And so I start with my most kind and charitable uh, com comparison, which is dogs. And if somebody wanted to have a large uh, farm of golden retrievers running around free, and then at you know, the end of the day, they just take out a couple with a crossbow, chop them up and, and send them out, I would have a, uh, I would want that not to be the case. And so then I go, okay, what, what differentiates a dog meaningfully from a cow or a pig? Well, that's because or... you, you, you feel much more strongly about the bow hunting is why. No, no, it's not the bow hunting. It's I, I try to start from my uh, my most benevolent moral instinct. Yeah, and but if they didn't kill the dogs, I wouldn't mind. If there oh, was if a they two acre, running around. If there was a two acre factory mm -hmm. that dogs just lived in and then didn't get shot. Yeah, I don't know how we would consume them. <laughs> that, well, that's my sorry. That was my point. My point is I don't mind the fact. I don't mind the living yeah, in a yeah. factory part if the definition of factory can be anything. We just have I to. Mind, yes, I yeah. mind other parts of it, which I think was his question. He right? did mention that we would consume them at some point. And I don't know how you consume a dog. Got it. Did I miss that part? Yeah. <laughs> no, but I think it's it's important that um, that we're, we're actually listening to each other. And you guys, I think, are naturals at you're, you're probably naturally conversant anyways. A lot of people will become defensive about the types of discussions that we're having because mm -hmm. maybe they've argued with people in the past and they're used to people giving facts to show that they're wrong. And it could be really tempting to want to to want to uh, argue with people and that type of thing. And it, it's really nice to see two people talking about that subject. Now, it's actually helpful that we're being recorded and we know people will be watching that. That's, <laughs> Best that, that's actually something I get a lot is how do you stay so calm and focused when you're having these conversations and you, you don't lose your cool, especially when they say, well, you can't be good without thinking that a God is real or something like that. They, they say very, or they may disparage me because maybe I, I do eat meat. Mm -hmm. And if I were to encounter a vegan, they may want to argue with me about that or, or tell me that I'm wrong or immoral or something. Mm -hmm. It's hard to take yourself out of it. But if you can and you can you can foster an open and honest environment like we're in, you can really have a good conversation and make progress on it. Mm -hmm. um, th this is a personal topic that I struggled to have to use the SE approach with yeah. when it's a moral issue. Sure. Um, it's really, that's really interesting. You know, when I was giving that, that list of you identify the claim, you work out your definitions, you figure out the main reason, and then you get to how are they verifying the reason is good. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes there's another layer there at the bottom, which is morality. Mm -hmm. I think I'm a good person because I I'm holding to this position. So it can often be beneficial if you can have a, a ask a couple of questions are you holding this view because you think you're a better person because of it? And if so, do you think that a person could be good without, well, by eating meat? Mm -hmm. That actually helps us establish whether this is a moral, if there's a moral underpinning to this view. Oftentimes with these deeply held beliefs, and not to say that this, maybe this isn't a deeply held belief, but if there's a moral underpinning, that in itself could be a barrier to belief revision and it's worth exploring. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So I, it sounds like uh, in this particular case, I, I would definitely say it's, it's got a strong moral component for me. Uh, the reason is more I, I deeply fear being bad. And so I imagine myself that Ben, ben kind of mentions, I imagine myself being born in 1820 in Alabama to a rich family. And I ask, would I be the guy that forsook all of these people working for free to give me what I want yeah, and turn to slaves? blind eye. Would I free them and then become an abolitionist? 
I said, well, I'll try to find a comparative thing in today's society and I'll see how I'm doing. Well, I'm not really standing up to any sort of societal pressures. <laughs> you know, whenever everybody says something is good, that kind of forms the basis of what I think is good. I'd probably be a slave owner. And that made me upset. I didn't like that. I didn't want to be that. And so I hmm. that that was really what informed it was a fear of being bad, um, a fear of, of committing moral atrocity, I would say. Right. Yeah. A lot of these views, especially God beliefs, uh, maybe not so much the supernatural beliefs like karma or that type of stuff, ghosts. But when it comes to eating meat mm -hmm. and God beliefs, <laughs> there's some overlap there when it comes to the moral underpinnings of it. And it could be really useful. You wouldn't think of it, but if, if a person that you're speaking with thinks that they can't be good without thinking that this is true, there's very little information that you can give them to yep. convince them that they're wrong. You have to first address that. And if you're convinced, Charlie, that you wouldn't be a good person without this belief, then this belief could very well be unshakable. Mm. I would say that the foundational belief, uh, it's not particular. Like if you convinced me, for instance, that cows were actually just secret robots that didn't feel pain. Like I would, I would move instantly. Um, I'm, mm -hmm. if you convinced me that uh, a cow suffered as much as uh, the, a blade of grass or, or a snail or, or something like that, I would be very, very open to it. The, I guess the deeper unshakable belief, which is really perhaps the most interesting one is that there are the good and bad are, are real categories. Well, I'm and one is meant to be deeply avoided and, and one is to be pursued. The belief is that mm. it's bad to cause an intelligent creature to suffer. Right. Well, yes. Intelligent? Uh, not intelligent. Um, it's 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 intelligent is not important to me. Um, the belief is is that uh, my I guess my my ethic is around the reduction of suffering. And there's a lot of amendments because at one level we could nuke the entire world. Everybody would be snuffed out in mm. an instant, and we wouldn't suffer. So there's like I've talked I've <laughs> talked to an antinatalist before. It was a great conversation. <laughs> he was just like, "Look, I know how to stop suffering. <laughs> we can just end it right now." <laughs> well, so if a, if a cow could be born without a brain, it sounds like what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm going to repeat back an yeah, example yeah. to make sure that we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. If I understand what you're saying, Charlie, if if, the, if there was some way to to raise an animal without a brain that that in turn would not feel pain, mm -hmm. there wouldn't be any suffering, and they treatment wouldn't be really be a factor, I think, Yeah. then there wouldn't be any issue with you whatsoever consuming meat. Lab grown meat, I'm, I'm very, very down for. Yeah. Do you, is it okay for us to try some seed epistemology with you? Sure. Okay. What claim would you like to discuss or, or surface? Mm. Well, let's, let's do the gun one. I, I, okay. I mentioned that I, that I shifted on guns. So my view is that it's probably beneficial for people to carry weapons with them in public, whether probably not, 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 uh, it could be concealed. I think concealed would probably be better than like on the hip or something, but I have, I have no reservations or my, probably on a scale from one to 100, I'm about maybe a 60% confident that carrying around guns in public is a good idea. And then my, oh, I'll just stop it there. That's my claim. Is it beneficial to allow or beneficial to do? I didn't totally understand. Meaning, meaning beneficial to allow, 1% of people might do it. Or beneficial to do, we might have 80% of people doing that. Uh, hmm. That's a good question. I guess I would say probably beneficial to allow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll go with allow. I think it's beneficial to allow people to walk around with weapons in public. Got it. I'm yeah. curious, why do you think that it's beneficial to allow mm. people to walk around with guns or weapons in public? Uh, I guess my main reason is that it would probably come down to the response time. So if I was at a university and I was doing some street epistemology mm. and I, I happen to hear gunshots and maybe somebody running by brandishing a weapon, I think if I were to have a gun on me, I could probably pull out the gun and maybe defend myself or or... I mean, worst case scenario, have to shoot that person if it looked like they were they were the threat. Probably faster than I could pull out my phone and call the police and and hope that they show up in a in a few minutes. And what you you mentioned that you changed on this. What what was the the thing that made you come to that belief? Was there an attack or something that happened, or was the news mm. or or a particular piece of information about response times? Uh, the funny thing is what changed my mind is I would actively go to open carry rallies to protest the people who were doing it. 
<laughs> so I, I would go out with signs and say, you know, guns are bad. And, and then finally some started coming up and talking to me and, and they made a really good case for the response time. So it was really something that I, it sounds kind of silly, but I just never even considered it. So it wasn't a specific incident or a news story. It was, it was talking to people who were proponents of open carry. Uh, And then they made a case that, uh, that if there was an incident, they probably would be able to respond better. Mm. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced that I would be an accurate shot or, Mm. or maybe it's conceivable. I, I could be, I could be engaging with a person who was also responding with a weapon Mm. and it really wasn't the shooter. It it could be a real mess. So uh, I'm not entirely convinced that it's a good idea, but it seems like it is. Is it, is it safe to say that what, what underlies this belief is that the belief that allowing people to have guns concealed carry saves innocent lives relative to not allowing for that. Is that, is that really the, the moral crux of it or saves injury perhaps as well? Yeah, I think it would come down to harm reduction. Got it. Yeah. Overall harm reduction. Yeah. And then I guess this is the what would change your mind. If is is it possible that you could see evidence that allowing people to have these guns actually increased, you know, oh, I thought that was a shooter, but it was just a guy with a, a pop gun and now an innocent died because um, of mm. that. Is there is there a, would you be open to evidence or what evidence might be required to show you that actually having a semi-armed population creates more deaths than simply allowing slow response time, which which does, I imagine, have deaths associated with it. Yeah, but Charlie, those studies, those <laughs> studies are just, you can't trust them. Those are made up and the, those lobbyists there, they're, they're coming up with these rules and these studies. I, I'd be really skeptical that a study could show anything like that. Hmm. If you... Uh, study accepted if from a and correct me if this is not the right street epistemology thing god's eye view if you knew that that were the case without without reference to a study you just were were capable of knowing it would the balance of lives and you found for instance that um say 100 people in a small town were likely to die with concealed carry allowed whereas only 50 would die without it would that change your mind, ignoring the uh, inability to trust the studies that would prove it? Hmm. Yeah, I think I think I would. That would probably impact me a little bit. Got it. So, so it so it does sound like that that harm reduction really is the core of this belief. Well, is that fair to say? Is there are there other factors that weigh in for you? Mm-hmm. I think we're, I think reducing overall harm is the biggest part of it. So yeah, I think, yeah, if, if there was a study, I guess I'd be a little skeptical that a study could be done to demonstrate that, that, uh, a preponderance of guns being open carried actually increased harm. That's what I think you're proposing. Mm -hmm. But I guess, yeah, if it could be shown that that was the case, then, you know, in order to be consistent, I think I, I, I'd probably want to go where the evidence took me. Yeah. I think we did it, right? That's yeah. kind of, that's it. You did it. And I was, I was doing a little you know, <laughs> saw acting and, and, and throwing up some resistance there too. But um, it, it's, um, we really covered a lot of the things that happened there. We identified the claim. We talked about the reason. I threw up a, a fake reason, yeah, well, yeah. Not, not a fake reason, but a, a reason that most people would say like, oh, I'm getting some resistance here. Now it's battle time. But mm-hmm. you didn't do that. You asked me questions to see, okay, let's, let's account for that. If we can account for that to your satisfaction. And yet we still saw a drop in harm because that's, that's what seems to be your standard, Anthony, what would happen? And in order to be internally consistent, most people will, will recognize that there's a disconnect there. Mm -hmm. Some people double down, Mm -hmm. but you, you can recognize that they've doubled down or that they're being inconsistent by not telling them that they are but asking questions to perhaps help them discover that they are. Well, and because correct maybe me, they're not. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I imagine you get to conversations sometimes where someone will go, listen, if you could convince me beyond a shadow of a doubt that everyone having guns actually increased harm, I would be against it, obviously. But there's nothing you could do to convince me of that because <laughs> of how corrupt the scientific community is. Uh-huh. So what do you do? Because right. I am, I can actually, that's completely believable for me to see in sure. the conversation about guns, vaccines, anything. Yeah. And so I'm curious, at that point, do you just consider 
the screw loosened and you let them go on their mm. way, what do you do when the person says, if you mm. could convince me of that with 100% certainty, yes, I would absolutely say, let's ban all concealed carry. But there's nothing you could, <laughs> but you can't. Nothing you could do to convince <laughs> me of that because you're not God and neither am I. <clears throat> Little catch 22, yeah. Right, so that can happen. And I think it's important to commend people when they've said something that you agree with or you find somewhat noble. Mm. Like, I think that's a really good point that you're that you're acknowledging that it might be actually difficult to test this. And I, I think I agree. I don't even know how we would be able to test to show mm -hmm. that crime went down and people were living longer lives and, and there were less deaths mm -hmm. if maybe there's a way to do it. And um, I acknowledge that it would be difficult. I think I'm on the same page with you. So agree don't just agree to get compliance and move the conversation forward. Be honest. Like I really do agree with that, with that point of view. I think it'd be really tough to measure, but what I would probably ask them is, well, how would you propose that we actually go about figuring out that this really is the case? If you don't think that there really could be a study, what is the next best way to figure out that this is a good idea? Mm -hmm. Well, I just know it. I've seen it. My friend saved his daughter <laughs> with a gun. You just know it. Yeah. I just know. Okay. It. <laughs> Why if, if, if I'm <laughs> this, so there's something called the outsider test for faith, but you can use it in a variety of different claims. I might say, well, I think that's, that's interesting. However, if we were to discover somebody else who said that they just know it and they're concluding the opposite approach, hmm. would you find that compelling? Well, no, they're wrong. <laughs> they're just wrong. Yeah. How would you react if they took, if they said the same thing about you though? They're wrong. I literally had this conversation with like, this is a thing that actually happens. Yeah. With, I, well, it's, they go, it's, no, they, they listen to Fox the, news. They're that's, Right. That's just dumb. CNN is real. <laughs> okay. How would you propose that we reach them? Do you the, have any ideas? The people who am I acting the, as, or am I acting as myself now? Or is no, that, no, 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 no. He's acting, acting as, as so, the character. Yeah, that take it playing. any way you want. Uh, basically I'm resisting getting frustrated mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> because when you, when you meet a, a person who's dug in like that, it could be, of course, it could be upsetting, Sure. especially if you've had, you spend a lot of time and then it seems like they're being disingenuous. I might, might even oh, I say think they're being super genuine. <laughs> I think they really they, mean it. They may, they may actually be sincere, but it could still be frustrating you is my point. Mm -hmm. um, you need to go where they take you. So I would say, well, how do you propose that we reach somebody? Let's say that there really is somebody who's just as dug in mm. or just as sure that they are correct. I recognize that they may, they may say that they know it. You're probably right. We could probably find somebody like that. How would you recommend that we break through to them? It's funny. I know. How could we help them take another look? Because now they're going to start, they will start probably giving realistic ways if they're, if they're being, remember, this goes back to being honest and open. Yeah. And if you have that, you're going to make great strides. If you have a conversation partner who's not exhibiting that, then you need to model it. And then you can also talk about somebody who has a competing view. How could we reach them? That They're mistaken in your view. What steps would you propose? And they're going to probably start giving really good ideas for reaching that person that you can in turn use to reach them. Got it. And Go where they take you. Use their, their language. Their consistency will likely kick in. And of course, it's a possibility Hopefully. that it doesn't. It, that that you just get Hopefully. you just boom and you go okay have a great day <laughs> and, you, and you may find out that they say well you know i guess when it all comes down to it i'm really firm on this belief because at a young age i had an uncle who was involved in a shootout and mm -hmm. or he and he was he was a bystander and he was killed there's usually an, a, an emotional undercurrent to these things yeah and you could say well if that event hadn't happened do you think that you would be just as as confident in your position today? Do you think you'd be a little bit more flexible if that traumatic event didn't happen? I'm really sorry that that happened. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, gosh, a lot a lot of these deeply held beliefs are there. There are emotional and moral underpinnings to them, but you don't know where you're going until you start. Yeah, so be be very methodical and be, be very respectful. And like I said, you'll, you'll make good progress when you use this approach. Yeah, no, I like it. And and we, we can start to wind down. But what I'm hearing just sort of in recap is that uh, I feel interested in changing the content of belief that that's of interest to me because I want to change behavior. You know, I want you to believe something differently so that you b begin to behave differently. And the shift is to just start this person and asking uh, questions about epistemology <laughs> you know how how do i know what i know even if you can't change the content of that mm. belief just getting mm -hmm. them to think oh how does other people how do they know what they know might that shed some light on uh f holes in or blind spots in my own life and uh 
while you might be unlikely to change the content of what someone believe, believes, you can start them down this process of like, I guess, just more philosophical, strategic thinking. About it. Do you find that street epistemology practitioners do question their own beliefs actively and often? Oh, yeah. Yes, we eat our own dog food. So we have a Discord server for street epistemology. There's Facebook groups, Reddits. Uh, we have videos where we're using SE on whether SE is good or effective. Is it, is it, is, is it beneficial for society? Is it harmful? Mm -hmm. What can we do to improve the method? And, and of course, other topics. Gosh, there's so many different subtopics in that Discord in that Discord server that somebody created. So yeah, we 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 were most people who learn this method see the value in it and see the benefit of it, where they recognize that it would be hypocritical if we didn't in turn use it on ourselves. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so, do you guys? I guess what I will, what I'm going to try to do is to sign myself up for grill sessions with the people, not grill sessions, but to to be. You know, uh, on the flip side of it, you know, to to, and I appreciate you you walking me through an example. Honestly, it's it's fun to have that attention on you. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I think that uh, I need that in my own life. Like I need I need my my most foundational beliefs questioned, requestioned, uh, art and it articulated or whatever. And so I'm going mm. to try to uh, enable my friends, encourage them to do more of that because. As fun as it is to do to other people, the one, they're not always willing. And second, you know, that's one way to change the world is by me telling everybody else that, that oh, wow, you've got some false beliefs and <laughs> let's dig into yours where I'm, I'm sure I have some as well. I'm thinking your, your wife or your child has a belief that you think is harming them. It's making mm. their life worse. And you come to them, you say, I would really like to talk to you about this topic. And they go, no, I'm good. You just go, okay, you're good. And just watch your yeah. wife or your child self-destruct until maybe there's a time that they come to you. And if they never come to you, then they just self-destruct and you tried your best. Like the, the ethics of street epistemology is murky, but it's really important to us. So the, the aforementioned course that I talked about, we will have a module on ethics. I think there's a sub channel on the Reddit about the ethics of SE. One thing that you can try to do is you can you can acknowledge that this is a topic that's off limits for them. Uh, you can ask them, you know, if any point in the future, if you want to talk about it, would you bring it up? You can ask them. I wouldn't. I would never. I don't. I don't think I would ever push a topic mm. that they weren't willing to do. Mm. Yeah. But remember, you can you can still use this approach on other claims, safer topics. You can talk about your son's AirPods if they make a complaint that it's falling out of their ears and it, it doesn't, doesn't hold, you can choose safer topics to demonstrate the technique with the idea of that. Maybe when they're ready, they can start using the approach on their own views, even those sensitive ones. Mm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Anthony. This has been uh, very interesting. I've got a lot to noodle on for, for myself and uh, my family. Thanks you. <laughs> if, <laughs> if I change, probably not to be fair. I still enjoy oh, okay. the sparring session. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on. It was, it was really a blast. Yeah. We Looking appreciate forward it. to it. All right. Thank you so much.